there's only really one way to get to be as good as Nick Saban. It's uh, either to have worked with him for many years, uh, a la Kirby Smart, and be a really, really good coach in your own right, or to just kind of cheat. What is up, everybody? It is Jake with Master of Football back at it again. Happy Monday. Thank you so much for being here. If you want to be up to date on everything college football, pro football, Madden, EA college football, NFL draft, anything related to American football, hit that red subscribe button. You will not be disappointed. Also hit the like button too and follow on Twitter. Twitter fam is growing. Without further ado, let's get into the video. So this video, and again, you can definitely tell that we are in the dog days of college football right now. I will let you guys know, less than 50 days away from college football. Let's go, baby. Boise State versus Washington is going to be on ABC at 2 o'clock. Well, 2.30. Whatever. It's going to be prime time. Let's go. Anyways, before that, though, there's something really interesting to see because you can tell that it's a little slow period right now. But again, we've got the media days coming up. There's lots of things to talk about there. Little storylines here and there. What's going to happen? What's your projection? There's something interesting that happened because there was three articles that came out just in the last couple of days about Tennessee. They weren't good. Now, they ultimately weren't too bad. Again, it's not too bad, although it's potentially one of the biggest fines we've seen in college football history. But we'll get to that in a second here. I think the more important point here is to see the reason why these things happen. And I think the reason, I don't want to say that Nick Saban committed those those infractions. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is that the incentive to commit those infractions comes from one man and one man only, the Grim Reaper of SEC coaches, Mr. Nick Saban. I'll get to that in a second. First, let's go with what we're talking about right now. So, again, three different articles here. Like I said, there's a little bit of a slow time in the sports world. So, Tennessee must vacate 11, all 11 wins from 2019 and the 2020 seasons. The 2020 season was the COVID year, so it was kind of, it was a, a weird one out here. But Chris Lowe reported this out here, and it said that they must vacate all the wins from 2019 and 2020 under former coach Jeremy Pruitt as a part of the penalties handed down by the NCAA stemming from recruiting violations, school officials told ESPN on Saturday. Tennessee avoided a, a postseason ban, but was hit with an $8 million fine, believed to be the largest ever, the, the largest levied in an NCA infractions case ever, and placed on five years probation, which includes a total reduction of 28 scholarships. The NCA deemed that the 16 players were ineligible when they played in those 2019-2020 games because of their involvement in what the NCA said were more than 200 infractions committed during Pruitt's three seasons at Tennessee from 2018 to 20. 20. And we see the fact that uh, Josh Heupel, and he, he was the one who was just this last season, the head coach they had, 11-2 and two record, really, really good, beat Clemson in the Orange Bowl, and he comes out and he says that two and a half years later, again, they're talk talking about how he calls this a huge relief, because when he took the job in Knoxville uh, in 2021, there was uncertainty of the severity of the NCAA sanctions hanging over the program. So think about this, the situation's bad, he comes in, he's like, listen, I understand I'm going to take this thing and work with it from there. And he says it's a huge relief that there's no bull ban. Now, they did mention the fact that there was an $8 million fine, uh, but, but continuing on, Tennessee's punishment included an $8 million fine for the school, which is believed to be an NCAA record. Former coach Jeremy Pruitt, and again, this is very important, who ran the program while those uh, violations occurred, received a six-year so show cause order, and the school is going to have to vacate some of its wins from that time. They've already gone over that 2019 and 2020. Those are all gone. So the more important question you might be asking yourself is, how the hell am I going to connect this to Nick Saban? Well, it's one of those things where uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And one big issue with being in the SEC is having to play Nick Saban on a week-in and week-out basis. You can definitely see the fact that people hire him from, you know, people hire coaches from his coaching tree. You just, we got to beat Nick, we got to be Alabama. Alabama can do it. Why can't we? Blah, blah, blah. Let's get after it. Boom, 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 boom. However, there's more issues than that. I think a lot of people think, oh, well, Alabama's clearly committing those NCAA violations as well. I, I have a really unfortunate truth here. I don't necessarily think it's the fact that, that Alabama's doing it as well. I think the bigger question is, are you guys just not nearly as good as Nick Saban? Because I think that's what it is. You're just not good as, as, as good as Nick Saban. There are some, we'll go into that in a second here, some of his coaches that have been successful. But I think the problem is people hire somebody from Alabama, assume it's going to be awesome. Oh, yeah, this is the reason why Alabama does so good. This is the reason why Alabama does so good. The big reason is Nick Saban, although people connect to other coaches. We'll see that list right here. So his list is insane. So Kirby Smart, when he was at Alabama, he's the Georgia head coach now. He's doing just fine. Jimbo Fisher, an up and down record with M A and M. Jeremy Pruitt, NCAA violations <laughs> at uh, at Tennessee. Uh, Will Muschamp, you know he's been with them a couple of times. He's been a head coach a couple of times here, so we'll see about that. Mark D'Antonio, again that was an OG when he was back at Michigan State. 
And then there's Derek Dooley, Jim McElwain, who I think is at Central Michigan right now. Lane Kiffin was there for a couple of seasons. You know, Jason Garrett was there for one season. I mean, what, what do we got here? Mario Cristobal was there for a couple of seasons. You know, uh, what do we have? <laughs> we got Brian Dable was literally there for one season. So it said Michigan State and Alabama. Brian Dable back in the day at Michigan State. But then Alabama, he was there for one year. Brian Dable got the New York, head, New York football Giants job. job because of what he did at Buffalo of uh, the Bills, not because of the one year he was at Alabama. I think that Nick Saban, Nick Saban is kind of like Mark Zuckerberg, okay? He doesn't necessarily come up with the ideas himself, but he knows that guy knows what he's doing. Hire him. Bring him on. What is that? What's that app called? Uh, Instagram? Buy it. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely stole it. What, what's that called? Uh, you know, tw Twitter? Let's just copy it. Make threads. <laughs> He's not an idea guy per se when it comes to his assistant coaches. He doesn't like take these guys from GAs and bring them all the way up. What he does is he's like, listen, I want the best. You're the best. You're going to be an assistant coach at my school. You were a head coach somewhere else. You're assistant coach on my staff. And people will take it because of what you can do to ep expedite their career. It's kind of a, again, I've heard Colin Coward call this before. We'd say Clemson was a family, whereas Alabama is a factory. You know what it is. You come in. You get churned out. You're a five-star recruit. You got the best of everything. You got the best coaches. Boom, boom, boom. They might only be here for one or two seasons. Again, the players might only play two, three seasons, something like that. Head on. Same thing with Alabama. But people think that you're automatically, just because you get somebody from Alabama, you're going to have the same success. Jeremy Pruitt has shown you that, again, you can't just do that whole situation. You can see the fact that there's a lot of these coaches out there in the SEC, not, not even necessarily in his coaching tree, that are still just trying. There's only really one way to get to be as good as Nick Saban. It's uh, either to have worked with him for many years, uh, a la Kirby Smart, and be a really, really good coach in your own right, or to just kind of cheat. Now I bring you guys to our good friend, Mr. Hugh Freeze. So Hugh Freeze, it was really interesting to see this perspective here because, I, I mean, I, coming up, you know, I paid attention. I knew that the fact that you know, Ole Miss had, uh, you know, Eli Manning and stuff like that. So he had some players coming up, but they're never really a football power as they used to, uh, you know, as you would think they would be. But you come down here and check out what he did. So when he started at Ole Miss in 2011, he was the 37th head coach. He said he wanted to retire at Ole Miss. And he did really, really well at some point. As a matter of fact, he did so well that... People started questions. I knew I questioned some things because I was like, wait, 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 wait. Ole Miss is really good now? Again, check this out. So coming over here to the 2012 class. So this is after. So his first class, he signed December of 2011. And then 2012. So these guys signed February of 2012. So again, this is just right after it. This is first class. Comes in here and he has all these guys. So with this. These guys were the 48th in the country. Now, there actually was some interesting names down here. Come down here and check this out. Bo Wallace was a quarterback. He was, he was all right there. Mike Hilton was a running back. Eventually, is now a slot corner in the NFL. But we come over here. So this is first class. And then when we come over here and check out his next class, 2013, uh, there was the 48th class in the country. And then it, let's just say it takes a little bit of a jump there. Whoa. So literally one year, and he went from the 48th class to the 8th class. So absolutely skyrocketed up. Robert Kondici, number one player in the country. Laramie Tunsil, number three player in the country. Laquan Treadwell, number three receiver in the country, number 28 overall. Absolute, I was like, what in the hell is going on? How the hell do you get all these guys in one season? It's absolutely amazing. We also see the fact that this happened in a couple other classes here. For the most part, the, you know, Ole Miss has re remained somewhere between like 18 to 22 in the classes of like the last seven, eight years. But again, when Hugh Freeze was there, I mean, the 2016 class too, the number five class in the country, your boy was killing it. Greg Little, number five player in the country. Shea Patterson, number three player in the country, number one quarterback. Also, Greg Little, number one tackle in the country. We see the fact that A.J. Brown, number five receiver in the country. A guy by the name of D.K. Metcalf, number 19 receiver in the country. How the hell did he get all of these guys? This is absolutely shocking. But again, it's not so much shocking because you see what happened to Hugh Freeze at all this. What do you know? There's a section in his Wikipedia called Scandals and Resignation. So in January of 2016, and again, this is just, just before he signs the 2017 class, the NCAA charged Ole Miss with numerous recruiting violations. Uh, the investigation reopened soon after off star offensive tackle Laramie Tunsil admitted to taking money for one of Hugh Freeze's assistants in February 2017, three months after suffering his first losing season since the year Freeze arrived. Ole Miss withdrew from bowl consideration for the upcoming season. The move came the same day the NCAA sent an updated notice of allegations charging the Rebels with eight additional violations. You can basically see the fact here. You bring in a coach, and he does really, really well. Abnormally well compared to the other teams. And again, here you saw the fact that he, here we go. Hugh Freeze in his uh, right here in, on September 19th, 2015, Freeze's Rebels 
uh, beat Alabama 43-37 in Tuscaloosa, making Freeze the only the third SEC coach, along with Les Miles and Steve Spurrier, to defeat a Nick Saban coach team in back-to-back seasons. Again, how was this happening? Uh, kind of cheating. In, in addition to cheating, it also just, in, Nick Saban just makes every single coach out there, and I'm going to say coach, I'll say every single administration out there crazy. As an example, Auburn is, I can't tell what Auburn is as a program. They are capable of doing really, really good things, but they are an absolute, from what I understand, behind the scenes. Not the fans, but there's there. it sounds like there's like 10 to 15, and by 10 to 15, I probably mean like 4 to 5, absolutely bananas uh, boosters out there. They've just got these, these a couple guys, Hey, that are just behind the scenes just doing crazy stuff. Again, you remember the whole situation with Ryan Harson and the fact that there was a cheating allegation that was alleg- that was put against him because they wanted to get him fired. It would- Go check that out on yourself. But I am going to say here the fact that, again, we see the fact that fire somebody from Nick Saban's staff. He commits a bunch of recruiting violations. Still can't beat Nick Saban. Okay? Bringing Hugh Freeze. Does actually a pretty good job. How is he doing it? Basically, he's just cheating. We see this next one here with the fact that Auburn has is completely irrational when it comes to his head their head coaching decisions here. So remember here, they, they fired Brian Harson earlier this year. He hasn't coached yet, and they are currently going to be paying him out. They're also paying out Gus Malzahn, who's actually doing a pretty good job out there at UCF. UCF is now in the Big 12 to a Big 12 coach, Gus Malzahn. So they're paying uh, Brian Harson not to coach where he was supposed to coach at, at Auburn. They're paying Gus Malzahn not to coach where he was supposed to coach at, at Auburn, and they're paying Hugh Freeze. They bought out his contract at Liberty, so they're currently paying three coaches to not coach where they're supposed to coach. That's what Auburn is doing. And again, I put it at the feet of Nick Saban. And it's super hard not to just look over the, the road, look at you know Tuscaloosa, and be like, how the hell is he doing all that stuff? His very first season when he was there, 2007, he was seven and six, and then it starts: 12 and two, 14 and 0, 13, 10 and three. 10 and three is a bad year. Uh, 12 and 1, 13 and 1, 11 and 2, 12 and 2, 14 and 1, 14 and 1, 13 and 1, 14 and 1, 11 and 2, 13 and 0, 13 and 2, and 11 and 2, with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 national championships there. Again, you see somebody doing it over there in the South there. So it matters more. Well, I'll tell you what, it matters more than this guy than anybody else. Look at all these. I mean, just dub, 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 national championship, national championship, national championship. He is absolutely killing it out there and forcing. Bad behavior, cheating, pillaging of his coaching staffs. He doesn't care. He still sticks with it. Now, let's just make sure that we have to give credit where credit is due here. It's not all, oh, yeah, well, people, he, everybody can't handle Nick Saban. They can't handle Nick Saban. Last year in the national championship, not this one we just saw, but the year before, when Georgia beat Alabama, I'm telling you, we've seen a little bit of a changing of a guard. Whether or not it's going to be permanent or not, I don't know, but we saw a different Georgia team play this last season because Kirby Smart, he's one of the few exceptions out there to absolutely be killing it right now. I mean, he got there in 2016 at Georgia, 8-5, and five, then 13-2, and 11-3, and 12-2, and 8-2, and, and then last year, 14-1 national championship, and this year, 15-0 national championship, SEC champs, everything, won every single game. They had a close one in the semifinals against Ohio State, but for the most part, he is the exception to the rule. He is the one person out there who is actually able to meet and exceed Nick Saban's level hit on a consistent basis. I hold off out Alabama. It's not all the time, but I'm saying these last two years, they have been the class and everybody else is trying to get on that level. Basically, Nick Saban's level. So whether or not it's Tennessee with the recruiting violations under you know Jeremy Pruitt, whether or not it's going to be Hugh Freeze with the recruiting violations at Ole Miss, whether or not it's going to be Auburn paying every single coach in the world to not coach where they're supposed to be coaching, you see the fact that Nick Saban has that effect on those other teams. They think they can do what he does. I'm telling you, it, it might not be, a, oh yeah, Alabama's cheating too, Alabama's cheating. No, it actually, the truth might be simpler than that. He might just be better than you, man. All right, guys, that's it. Thank you so much for being here. Please get in the comments right now. What do you think about the whole Tennessee violations? I actually do appreciate the non-bowl, man. Eight million bucks. That's a lot of money. That's what that's what uh, Boise State gets in a whole entire season. I know it's not very much those SEC schools out there. But again, that's a lot to be levied against them. But you guys get in the comments. Let me know what you think about this whole situation. Remember, like, share, comment, subscribe, and follow on Twitter. I'll see you guys later. I am out.